subscribe to this channel the teaching show and press the bell icon welcome back to this course on material and energy balance in this video we will learn how to write balance equations on various types of processes so before writing balance equations one should know the fundamental laws on which these equations are based so there are three fundamental laws law of conservation of mass first law of thermodynamics and Newton's second law these are these are the fundamental laws and what this law of conservation of mass tells you it says that mass can neither be created nor be destroyed so if in a if you consider any process then whatever the mass the amount of mass which is going in the same amount of mass should be coming out similarly a first law of thermodynamics it states that energy of uh, the total universe is constant so energy can neither be created nor be destroyed it can just change forms so you convert energy from one form to another so basically what you see is then mass is a conserved quantity as well as energy is a conserved quantity so this equation gives you that mass is a conserved quantity let's write what are the conserved quantities okay so mass is a conserved quantity first law of thermodynamics gives you energy is a conserved quantity similarly newton's second law it says that summation of all forces is equal to rate of change of momentum so momentum is again a conserved quantity we are not bothered about momentum in this course it is taken care of in fluid mechanics course but for now, we are just bothered about mass and energy. So what we say is that mass is a conserved quantity and energy is a conserved quantity. So you can write uh, balance equations only on a conserved quantity because they are not being uh, destroyed or created. Okay, so whatever is going in should be coming out. So I should do the simple addition and find out uh, my balance equations. Okay, so we are not bothered about momentum balance right now I can write equations and find out whatever mass is going in how it is coming out whatever energy is going in how it is coming out so I can write down equations on mass and energy because these are the conserved quantities so whatever equations I write then they are known as balance equations so I can write balance equations on mass and energy now these balance equations, they take different forms for different types of processes. So when we write balance equations, we have to take into consideration which type of process we are handling. So in chemical engineering, we divide our processes into three main groups or categories. First is your batch process. In a batch process, say for example, you have a process unit. You just charge this unit with your feed. And then uh, once you have charged the process unit with the feed, then after that, say you have charged the feed at time t equal to t0, then nothing crosses the system boundary. No material or no mass crosses the system boundary after time t equal to t0. Okay. Then we allow whatever is happening, say mixing is taking place or a reaction is taking place. Say if it's a reactor, a reaction is taking place. If it is a mixer, then mixing is taking place. We don't allow anything, any mass to cross the boundary. But we do allow energy to cross it. So you might want to heat it. If it is suppose a reactor, I might supply some amount of heat to it so that it is brought up to the temperature of the reaction. Okay, so heat can cross the boundary. Similarly, if it is my mixing unit, then I can also do work on it in the form of a stirrer work. Okay, so I can stir the contents to mix them, but in a batch process. So material is not crossing the boundary, but only energy can cross the boundary in the form of either heat or work. So this is a batch process. Once your mixing has been done or your reaction has completed, then what we do is we open the reactor and take out the products. So, when the process is going on, no material or mass crosses the system boundary. That is the requirement for a batch process. 
Why do we use batch process? Sometimes you have to produce uh, quantities in a very, uh, you have to produce chemicals in very small quantities which are very expensive. So you need to have maximum conversion, you have to have a very tight control on the quality of the product. All these things are possible in your batch reactor. So that's why this batch process is used. Second is your continuous process. In a continuous process, you have a process unit or a process, there is a continuous inflow of feed. So your feed is going in continuously into the process unit and you draw your products or you withdraw your products continuously. Okay, so feed is going in continuously, product is drawn out continuously. This type of process, this continuous process, is often used when you have to produce uh, chemicals in bulk amount. Say for example, a petroleum refinery for example. In that, you have to produce your petrol, diesel, kerosene, all these things in a very large amount. So the daily throughput is very high. Okay, all these products, then they require that you have a continuous production. You cannot have a batch production. So you might have seen large distillation towers in petrochemicals where the feed is coming in continuously, fractionated and the products are taken out continuously. Okay, so this is a type of continuous production or continuous process. Usually it is used when you want to have a very high drop. That type of process is your semi-batch process. It is neither batch nor continuous. So it's a mixture of these two. So say for example, I will explain it to you with an example. Suppose it is a dryer. Now I have made a product which has a very high water content. I want to reduce the water content. So what I will do is, I will place that material in a dryer. So it looks similar to your batch process. At the initial time, say t equal to t0, I have placed my chemical over here. Now, what I do is, next I supply heat. So, what will happen? Water will start evaporating, okay, and the substance will get dried. But, I have to remove the water, water vapors which are coming out, okay. So, in this case, even after time, say t equal to t0, I am removing some amount of material, but I am not adding something. So, in a semi batch process basically, like in a dryer, what I have, I don't have any input after time t equal to t0, time greater than t equal to t0 I should say. I don't have any feed stream, but I do have a product stream. It is not a useful product, but I do have something which is going out. So, there is no inlet, but there is an outlet, okay. Vice versa can, can also happen. So instead of a dryer, let's say I have a mixing unit. So this is my mixing. Okay. So this is also can be an example of a semi-batch process. I want to mix two or three components. Okay. So initially I have charged this mixer with component A. Now I want to mix component B and C with A. So what I can do is I can add B after say time greater than t0 but I am not drawing any product out of it. Okay, So there is a mass flow into the system but there is no mass flow out of the system. Okay, So this is not a continuous process. In a continuous process you need to have both the streams. There should be an inlet stream which is going in and a product stream which is continuously coming out. But in semi batch process either you have an inlet stream or an outlet stream but not both of them. So say dryer in which you do not have an inlet stream but you do have an outlet stream or for a mixer you have an inlet stream but you don't have an outlet stream. So this is, these are examples of semi batch process. So these are three different types of processes which we use quite often in chemical engineering. Then next we will see can also be classified as steady state processes or unsteady state processes. So in steady state processes, the flow streams, various composition of the flow stream, various variables say temperature, pressure, composition of flow streams and all these variables, the process variables within the process units, they do not change with time. 
That is the basic definition of steady state process. So when you have a steady state process, usually what happens is, say for example, I have this process. This process can be a reactor. Then there is an inlet stream and an outlet stream. And I am saying that this is a continuous process. So there is a continuous inflow of heat. There is a continuous outflow of product. Okay. Now, if it is a steady state process, then all the variables, process variables of the index stream, of the outlet stream, and all the process variables within this process unit, they do not change with time. Okay, that means the compositions over here, the compositions over here, the feed rate over here, the product rate over here, temperature and pressure within the reactor, the amount which is there in the reactor, all these things remain constant with time. They do not vary with time. They may fluctuate a little bit about a constant value. So these are known as steady state processes. Usually, continuous processes are run on a steady state. Then you have unsteady state processes in which what happens is that these values of the process variables of various flow streams and also within the process unit, they change with time. Best example is, usually when you, when you talk about your batch process or your semi-batch process, they are inherently unsteady state. Why? Because in a batch process, what happens? Say, if it is a reactor, you have charged the reactants in the reactor. With time, what's happening? More and more reaction is taking place. So, your composition is changing. So, your process variables are changing. If it's an exothermic reaction, then it might happen that uh, temperature is rising, okay? So temperature and pressure also again changes. So in a batch process or a semi-batch process, it is inherently an unsteady state process because your process conditions are changing with respect to time. So in a steady state, more, mostly continuous process, your variables do not change with time. In unsteady state process, your variables change with time. So we have studied uh, various types of processes, say continuous, semi-batch and batch processes. A question might arise in your mind that why we are studying these types of processes and why we are interested in writing down balance equations on these processes. First of all, uh, you must know for a desired throughput, how much feed you should supply. Okay, and then um, how much um, heating load or cooling duty you should uh, apply. So all these things are taken care of when you write balance equations on mass and energy. So I will take an example. Let's say that this is my process unit and a stream of let's say methane is going in. Okay, now methane is going in at a, speed, at a rate of m1 dot. So m1 dot, let's say it is in kg per second. Now, Methane is coming out of it, okay. Again, it is, say, M2 dot, units are kg per second. Simplest type of your balance equation would have been M1 dot is equal to M2 dot. If I observe, then um, that my M1 dot is not equal to M2 dot. What does it mean? It means that somehow your methane is accumulating within the process unit. So, there is an accumulation within the process unit. Or I can say that methane is undergoing certain reactions. If input is not equal to output, then input minus output should be equal to accumulation. That's what we have seen. Okay. Now, there is another thing which can happen. A reaction can take place and your methane can be generated or consumed. Okay. So, if it is generated, then you can have input plus generation minus output and if it is getting consumed, say it is decomposing to CO2 and H2O, then minus consumption. So your general balance equation then becomes input per plus generation minus output minus consumption that is equal to accumulation. I am calling this general balance equation because I can similarly say that energy can be whatever the energy which is input minus output plus generation by any reaction minus consumption by any reaction that is equal to the energy accumulation within this system. So we have seen general balance equation of the form input, input plus generation minus output minus consumption is equal to accumulation. Input is the material which is crossing the system boundary. Okay, So this is coming in through this system boundary. 
generation. It is taking place within the system. That your system is what? It is your process or process unit. So generation within the system. Output again, whatever the material which leaves the system boundary. Okay. And consumption within the system. And this is equal to accumulation of material within the system. That is your process. Okay. Now, this is your general balance equation. It can again take two forms. So, this general balance, it, take, it can take either the form of a differential balance or an integral balance. In a differential balance, each term is a rate. That is, if I am talking about uh, material balance equation, then each of these terms, they take the form of rate, that is mass per unit time. So, it is the mass per unit time which is coming in. Mass is just, uh, you cannot say if, uh, mass, but I can say any species which is generated within the system. Mass which is going out, which is getting consumed, that is equal to accumulation within the system. Okay. So, differential balance is basically a rate form of the equation and it is used for a continuous process because in a continuous process everything is flowing in at some some speed at some rate okay so differential balances are written on a continuous process it gives you what is happening at any instant of time so when you solve these equations you should be able to tell exactly at what point what were the system variables at that point in contrast to this, integral uh, balance equations, they describe what happens between two points. These are usually used for a batch reactor. In integral balances, um, usually when we integrate it, so from time interval uh, 0 where you have charged the batch reactor to the time uh, when you take out the products. So between that, what were the system variables, what were the quantities they were taking, I am not bothered about that. I am only bothered about what is the final value of these variables. So